Hello and welcome to Introduction to Wilderness Leadership. My name is Frank. I'll be the instructor for the course and I am looking forward to meeting you all in, in class on Thursday. This introduction lecture um, is going to be the first of our Tuesday asynchronous lectures and it's going to be a uh, multimedia so there'll be uh, my video and the presentation I'm presenting and you can toggle back and forth make one bigger smaller whatever in this Kaltura program so you can play with that a little bit. In the course or on Thursday we're going to cover we're going to go over the syllabus get to know each other all that which is going to be awesome to be able to do that in person. I just want to make sure a couple things before I start on this lecture one is I want to make sure you've looked over the syllabus. So click on that, go through that, kind of read that over, um, and we'll talk about those expectations. And obviously I'll be available to, uh, to uh, help with any of that as well. And uh, the other things uh, is to make sure you've gotten or are getting your textbook for the course. And the last thing, is that we will uh, be discussing uh, goals for the course. So if you would think about and maybe jot down a couple goals you have uh, for this course, that would be terrific. And we will uh, talk about those in class. It'll really help me cater the course to you and be able to help you um, uh, the best I can during this course time. All right, so this uh, lecture, this talk is talking about clothing systems uh, to be effective for the outdoors. And it also is talking about uh, potential cold weather injuries, things that happen if you think go wrong with your clothing system, if you're not prepared or your clothing doesn't work or whatnot. Um, one thing to be aware of is on Blackboard, I've uploaded lecture notes for this. Uh, if you have a printer, you could print them or you could read them ahead of time or read them after, review them, whatever. Uh, it's basically everything I've talked about here. So the first thing I want to talk about uh, in regard to clothing systems and whatnot is we wanna make sure to enjoy being out in Alaska. This clothing system talk is coming from a recreational or professional or leader perspective and is not coming from a survivalist perspective where our plane crashes in the Arctic and we have to figure out how to survive with our, you know, our toothpick and our Swiss Army knife or whatever. Um, we're, we're able to be prepared and so we choose to be out and that's an important thing to realize about any of the outdoor recreation but specifically about being prepared and, and choosing to be leaders and whatnot is, is we are making that choice to be out. We can prepare for the outing ahead of time. It's, it's super significant as well. So we can make sure that we're prepared and the people who are taking out are prepared. It's important to, to be pretty dialed on uh, these clothing systems and understanding materials and, and kind of what you need for what weather and, and things like that so that not only can you take care of yourself, which we'll, we'll talk about during the course as being super important, but also so that you can help your participants take care of themselves. And that's going to be a, a, a definite key to, to going out. Um, there's lots of different ways to go out in Alaska and sometimes the requirements for clothing or for whatnot are different. If you're doing an easy car camping trip um, with a group of friends, you know, 20 miles from town is totally different than doing a 30 day trek through the Alaska range or some such thing. So uh, uh, the, the, the type of activity uh, determines to some degree what we need when we're out. Another thing to realize is that there's uh, lots of different uh, physical capacities that people have, uh, whether it's uh, differences in cold and heat tolerance, things like that, but also different levels of acceptable suffering. Some people are suffer machines and they can just go out and, and really uh, not be concerned about a day after day consistent level of suffering. And some people are less like that and they're more prone to having problems uh, with that. Um, and the last thing to discuss, uh, sometimes I like to put all of this in terms of the type of fun. So in Alaska here, 
uh, some people define it as type one fun, type two fun, type three fun. So type one fun is it's fun all the time. It's beautiful weather, you have plenty of food. Uh, there's not a lot of suffering involved. It, it, it's really a fun time and enjoyable for most of the trip. Type two fun is what we have a fair amount of the time here in Alaska. You're cold, you're hungry, um, it's really hard, it's difficult, it's challenging. These are the trips many times you remember later, more, more so even than the type one trips a lot of times. These are the trips you get, you, you really think out there while you're doing it, this sucks, this is really hard. But when you get back to town the next day, the next week, maybe the next year, depending on the trip, uh, you, you begin to think, oh yeah, this was awesome. Uh, that the bad memories fade, the good stuff floats to the surface and, and it was really a powerful experience for you. That's a good experience. That's one that what we will probably have in this course to some degree. And then the type three fun is the kind we want to avoid, both as people and as leaders. This is the type of fun where you never want to do it again. Um, for me, an example is going ice climbing at negative 30 Fahrenheit. I've done it. I've done it multiple times. Every time it sucked really bad. It's uh, been probably dangerous. It really is not very functional. The ice doesn't work well at 30 below. Your hands don't work well. Uh, it's really not an experience I ever want to have again. So that's just an example of what type three fun would be. And if you take someone on an overnight backpacking trip and they're not prepared, the, everything's miserable, uh, you don't have enough food, whatever, you could create a type three fun situation for someone as a leader that doesn't necessarily need to have that and, and they might never go out again. So it's something we want to be aware of and avoid. Uh, when we're in that leadership role in the outdoors. Just a picture of a, a very cold, windy uh, outing in the Alaska range. So, it's important to realize that your body is a heater. So when you're out, clothing doesn't create warmth. Your body is creating warmth. And this means a lot of things to us as far as uh, both our clothing systems and also what we eat and whatnot. Basically clothing maintain, retains heat in the dead air space. Um, so that's, that's really important to think about when you're thinking about your different clothing systems. Another thing that uh, is important is that there is no clothes dryer on, on trips. Um, sometimes you have the sun, which would be considered a clothes dryer, but overall, we have to dry our own clothes out. So doing something like taking a wet pair of gloves, putting them on your chest, on your core, and then getting in your sleeping bag and going to sleep while extraordinarily unpleasant at times might be the best way to dry something out. Um, our extremities never have enough heat pressure, uh, enough uh, uh, warmth to typically to be able to dry anything out. So worn hats, gloves, uh, socks, things like that don't usually just get dry from wearing them dry. We need to put them onto our core, put extra layers on and use our body as a clothes dryer out there. This also works very effectively with our base layers. So for example, if I'm hiking along in a t-shirt and it's uh, 30 degrees out and I stop and um, I'm gonna lose my heat very quickly. So if I can capture that heat uh, by with putting on a puffy coat and then I'll have enough vapor pressure inside that warm layer to basically push any accumulated moisture in my base layers out into my parka or the next layer out. And you're like, whoa, your parka gets wet. Well, then you can take your parka into your sleeping bag and force that layer out into your sleeping bag. And it's like a tiered system of using the heat from your body as a clothes dryer in the field. So one of the keys to getting out is how to stay dry. And this, this applies somewhat more to the winter when we're, we've got a fairly dry general environment, but this also applies to some of the summer stuff that we'll do. 
and this stuff in between, which quite honestly, most of this class will take place in between summer and winter. But one of the first ones, keys to staying dry, is not to sweat as much. So this includes things such as um, not putting too many layers on at the trailhead. So you want to make sure you try to start cool. So as you get out of the car, realize that if you're warm and toasty standing there and you're going to go walk up a hill, you're going to be hot and sweaty. So you need to dress appropriately or strip down appropriately to have clothing system that works for that. Um, you want to take time if you mess it up to change your, your layer system. So in other words, go five minutes, warm up a little and stop and take off those layers. That's not always the most efficient way. It's better if you can do it ahead of time, but the stopping and taking it off works fine too. Um, regulate your pacing with temperature. So, or uh, with, um, regulate your body temperature with pacing, excuse me. And this, this is gonna happen where you're going along the flats at a perfectly good rate. Your body is in great uh, homeostasis, you're not sweating a ton, you're not super cold, and then you come to a, a little uphill. You know it's going to be five minutes of like kind of brutal uphill. Instead of trying to maintain that same pace and getting all sweaty, you can cut your pace back a little bit and, and know that it's going to get flat right back up there and you're going to be perfectly dressed for the weather and so to sort of take it slow going up the hill and then and then get right back on it. So that would be using your pacing to control your moisture. And another one, which I'll talk about several times, but is to wear the most breathable clothing that the conditions allow. And I'm going to talk about this uh, in different aspects of the clothing systems, but basically wearing a rubber, a rubber a rain jacket while you're hiking and it's not pouring rain is not going to be very conducive. You're going to be soaking wet on the inside of that from sweat. On the other hand, wearing uh, just a fleece jacket in the pouring rain also would be an example of not wearing the appropriate clothing because you'd be, you wouldn't have any protection from that external moisture. So you want to wear things like breathable soft shells and things like that if the wind and the weather don't mandate uh, wearing a, a, a less breathable layer like a hard shell jacket, a rain jacket, something like that. Another thing you can do is dry in small amounts. We'll, we'll, again, going back to that concept I introduced in the last slide, um, forcing that moisture out. Many times when I take a break more than five or 10 minutes, I'll just pop, pull my puffy coat out of my, jack, out of my bag and put it on. It helps that to, to slowly just be moving the moisture I'm accumulating in some of my base layers outward and, and dries in, in small amounts. So that's great. And also using the sun to dry when possible. So for example, if I have wet socks that I'm kind of switching back and forth between, um, it's better if they're damp than wet. So I might um, put them on the outside of my pack to dry in the sun wear them for half the day, switch socks at lunch, put the new wet socks on the outside of my pack, and then try to dry those out. So drying in small amounts like that is helpful. Um, and using your clothing system to dry stuff out as well, within reason. And we'll talk about kind of reason when we're in the field a little bit more. If something is wring it out dripping wet, it almost never makes it into my sleeping bag. But damp stuff, stuff I can mitigate with, with just some sweat moisture and whatnot, um, a lot of times that comes in and I work it into my sleep system to help dry stuff out. Uh, another one is just avoiding external moisture from the environment. So this is stuff like not being careful with your gear, not dropping mittens in the snow and filling them up with snow, not going over the top of your boots with snow and filling them up with snow and getting a bunch of, of moisture in there through carelessness, things that are preventable. Leaving your stuff on the floor of your tent where you know it's probably going to be damp or wet and, and waking up and having like your gloves be soaking wet because they're in a puddle on your tent floor. Um, that Those would be examples. Another one is what I was discussing earlier with wearing your soft shell and and making sure that you are wearing appropriate rain gear. If it's raining or it's wet snow, then you wear a hard shell. If it's just breezy and windy, maybe a teeny drizzle, you might decide to wear something more like a soft shell or a windbreaker or something that doesn't provide as much protection. But thinking about that in terms of mitigating the amount of moisture in your 
equipment uh, through your choices. All right, so involved with all this are some key, some key points to some of the layering systems. So the first one is that you need to make sure to be able to move the water from your body, your sweat and whatnot away from, from you. So having wicking base layers, uh, this, this uh, makes sure that the moisture moves outward. So they're typically synthetic or wool base layers um, and we can increase the movement of moisture uh, when we come to a stop or whatnot. In other words, dry out those base layers by adding layers on top, which will help force the moisture outward and dry some of those layers. When another key for me is, is when I'm thinking between two layers, so I've got this big old heavy snowboarding jacket that's Gore-Tex, but it weighs like three pounds, and I've got a lightweight little eight ounce, um, also breathe, waterproof breathable Gore-Tex type jacket. I'm gonna choose the lighter of those two, and it really comes down to the, the lighter it is, the less water it will absorb, the quicker it'll dry. So that's kind of my overall concept for most of my gear. The quicker drying and lighter a piece of gear is, the, the more functional it is in many cases. Obviously, sometimes you need heavier layers for insulation and whatnot, but it just as a general concept. Again, I've mentioned this twice already, but the most breathable layer suitable for the conditions. This is not wearing the rubberized rain gear when you're hiking up a big hill um, when it's not raining. Uh, it's using equipment or clothing that, that hopefully can be as breathable as possible and also as quick drying as possible. Making sure, I almost always in Alaska here, almost always have a, some kind of a puffy coat. And this could be a synthetic insulated coat, a down insulated coat, something like that, that I use both for the cold, but also for uh, making sure that uh, I've got something to help in my drying system for, for layering. Keeping boots or footwear dry as much as possible, or if you know they're going to be wet, which much summer hiking, especially off trail tundra, you know, muddy four wheeler trails, things like that, your shoes are going to be wet. And so um, wearing shoes that dry as quickly as possible. So sometimes that that precludes the, the heavy, like um, super duty hiking leather hiking boots because the first time you go over the top of those into a puddle, they might fill up with water and they might be wet for the next week that you're hiking. And so sometimes I'll choose like a trail shoe that's synthetic that might not have quite as much support. It's not Gore-Tex or whatever waterproofing, but I know that when I step in that puddle, you know, 20 minutes later, my shoe's gonna be just damp. It won't hold water. I won't have to dump them out and whatnot. I'll just walk them dry because I know in another half hour, or another hour, I'm gonna go into another creek or another puddle. And so sometimes that's the mitigation strategy. And then when we get more into winter, it's, it's uh, choosing different um, uh, footwear that maybe has the insulation doesn't absorb a lot of water, a bunch of snow doesn't go over the top into the boots, things like that really help as keys for this layering system. Um, so throughout this presentation, I'll talk sort of about some of the things that I've discovered over the years as far as clothing systems go. But generally speaking, my clothing system for both summer and winter, I like to call it the, my 5-4 clothing system. Almost always, I'll bring five tops and four bottoms. And the tops include things like a range, hard shell rain jacket, hard shell rain pants, a puffy coat on top, an insulated um, top, um, and, and a few other various layers as well, a good base layer and whatnot. But basically I find that in most cases I can get away with that kind of 5-4 system for most of the things I do. Doesn't mean it's gonna work perfect for you, but it really has been effective for the kind of things that I found. Now that said, I adjust that 5-4 system. I have different pieces for different temperatures. So I have a big like expedition puffy coat for when I go out, it's negative 20. And I have a small little synthetic puffy coat for um, normal summer Alaska use. And, and so it's going to be, it's the, the system varies, but the concept is the same. And one of the things that comes about as far as that goes too is 
I'm not bringing six base layers on a six day trip. And then every time one gets wet, I get to camp, I don't pull my base layer off, crumple it into a wet ball and stick it in the bottom of my pack. I, instead, um, I will put my parka, my puffy coat on over the top and try to dry that base layer out so that I'm not using multiple base layers because that base layer you've taken off that's soaking wet is literally just a, a, an anchor in your pack. It's, you're never gonna put it on again because it's soaking wet and it, it's not gonna be a functional for the trip anymore. So uh, just an example of, of how that might work. So some of the things that are common as an outdoor leader is to have to sort of educate people on this. So we're gonna want thin wicking base layers, quick dry pants. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've gotten groups together for trips and people show up in jeans, you know, which are cotton and dry very slowly, hold a lot of water, don't have any windproofness or technical characteristics. Um, I, I've already mentioned that we're gonna wanna bundle up during breaks to help drive the moisture away from the body. And then it's also important to consider what level of wind and wetness protection um, we've got to, so that we don't lose that heat through convection. It doesn't get sucked away from us. So making sure we have wind layers um, that are effective. So overall, extremities are harder to keep warm than your core body temperature. So um, as we get towards winter, we're gonna have to think more about our footwear choices. Um, during summer, some of the ways that I'm, I'm thinking about it is I'm uh, uh, bringing multiple pairs of socks and basically switching them out. So it's one area where I am bringing more. I'm bringing, let's say, three to possibly even four sets of, of nice wool socks. Maybe have one set aside specifically for sleeping in. So I keep them totally dry and sleep in them. I'd wear them in an emergency, but overall they're, they're just set aside. And then I switch back and forth between the couple pairs of damp socks I have maintaining as dry feet as I can. But um, as we get towards winter, we're gonna look at things like mucklucks and Neos overboots and bunny boots and things like that to help us with uh, our extremities. Keeping our feet warm uh, is gonna be super important. So I find, and especially for myself, that hands are an area that's really hard to deal with. Uh, and this is true summer and winter. During the summer, many times, uh, almost always, I'll bring at least uh, a set of lighter gloves that have some wind and moisture protection. Um, and uh, as we get towards winter, I'll bring multiple pairs of handwear. So most of the time as we get to winter weather, I'll have at least three sets of handwear, partially because you can't dry them out effectively on the go, partially because you're in snow and, and in wet snow falling or rain or sleet or whatever, and your handwear is getting wet throughout the day. So it's um, important that you can be able to switch that out when you need to. So an example might be a light pair of gloves, a heavy pair of, of uh, gloves for doing stuff in when it's cold, and a pair of mittens that I don't have good dexterity in, but are, are very uh, quite warm and can be kind of my backup or when I'm sitting around camp or whatever, I can wear those. So ears, nose, and face um, are gonna be important for, especially for winter, but even on summer trips, I almost always have a couple of hats. So for example, I might have two light little fleece hats. They both weigh about an ounce, but they go on almost every trip. And typically how I might use them is I might have one that I try to keep dry and one that I'll wear like actively during the rain. So I'll just let it get wet. So I'll put it on, I'll, I'll hike when it's raining. It'll keep my body, you know, when it's 40 and raining, it'll keep my body functional and whatnot. But I know that's wet, but when I get to camp into my tent, into a shelter, whatever, and I'm, I'm sleeping or I just need to warm up, I've, I know I've got a dry hat available. It's one of the lightest ways to provide yourself some of that warmth and security. So having that, those little hats. Um, as we get towards winter, we start to talk about our extremities as far as our nose and our ears and things like that. And we start to talk about frostbite, which I'll get to as I talk about the cold weather injuries here during this presentation. So one thing that can be a little frustrating or a little bit intimidating for people who haven't done 
um, a ton with this or haven't like delved deep into uh, outdoor equipment and clothing. And that is uh, understanding some of the differences. So for example, I'm gonna talk about some of the differences in shells. So when someone says, oh yeah, bring a shell along, a wind shell, a rain jacket, whatever, a lot of times they mean sort of different things. And, and the different types of shells in general categories have different advantages to them. So I'm just gonna discuss those a little bit in hopes that it'll help you when you're making your decisions about shells. So I'm gonna start out with the membrane hard shell. So most people, when they think of uh, a, ja a rain jacket or a shell, this is what they're thinking of. They're thinking of a Gore-Tex membrane hard shell, uh, fairly full featured jackets, generally with lots of pockets and things like that. The outer material is made out of nylon um, and the inner material has a rubberized coating called Gore-Tex on it or one of the other brands of Gore-Tex, H2 no, no conduit, whatever. But basically it provides the ability for vapor to transfer through but water droplets not to come in. The outside is treated with a durable waterproof finish or DWR of the nylon and that makes the jacket bead. So when you flick water at a Gore-Tex jacket when it's new, beads up and looks super waterproof. As they get older, that outer coating wears off. Doesn't necessarily mean your jacket is leaking in the sense that the Gore-Tex membrane in theory is still doing its job. One problem is, is that when the DWR coat goes away, the, uh, the membrane uh, can't breathe. And so you do get wet from sweat and you think, oh, this jacket stinks. It doesn't work anymore. It's leaking when really what it's doing is not breathing like it did when it was new. Um, Gore-Tex jackets like this have some advantages. One of the advantages is they tend to be one of the more waterproof and windproof choices that we'll carry in the field. So if it's really rainy or it's rainy, uh, all go towards these. They tend to be full featured so the hoods fit really well and they have pockets and all that kind of stuff and that's that can be great. Um, they're medium as far as weight. Most of these type of jackets weigh between about, we'll say, six or eight ounces up to about a pound and a half for a Gore-Tex type rain jacket. And um, so that means they absorb a medium amount of water um, once their DWR coat wears away or they're in rain for weeks, they, um, they, they do absorb a bit of water they aren't super breathable. So if I'm working really hard, it is a delicate balance of like, do I get more wet from the inside or from the outside in a rainstorm when I'm pushing it hard up a hill? So they're not super breathable. They also tend to be pretty, a, a little restrictive. They don't stretch a ton and they also tend to um, uh, be quite expensive. So those are all, some pluses and minuses to something that would be your normal membraned hard shell. So there are some other things that are shells. And so this is an example of a lightweight soft shell jacket. So soft shell generally means materials that are stretchy, that aren't like a crunchy nylon. These jackets are have a nice tight weave to them and the weave prevent, uh, protects or, or, or uh, create some of its windproofness. Uh, they tend to be what I like to consider kind of the cotton hoodies of the outdoor world. They're, they're very comfortable and I enjoy wearing them. Their limitations um, lie and they don't tend to be quite as technical. They absorb a little bit of water, um, not, not a ton, but they absorb more than the next uh, material I'll talk about. Uh, they aren't super waterproof or super windproof. So these tend to be for when it's a bit windy, um, maybe a little drizzle, but, um, and, and uh, what they're really good at though, is they're really good at breathing. So they tend to be one of the more breathable things that I have that I know I can have a fairly high output and not get super sweaty inside them and have a little bit of wind protection so they're, they're one of my main go-tos for a lot of what I do. I really like these lightweight soft shell um, jackets, shell jackets, um, and they're quite effective. So an, another type of jacket that's in the same category is going to be 
a, a microfiber nylon. So that's something like this, one of these, this is a Houdini jacket, really lightweight. They create their waterproofness by having a really tight weave. They don't have any membrane or Gore-Tex or anything like that. So they're uh, really tight weave. Microfiber just means small denier fibers, small diameter fibers, and they're tight together. And so they maintain a fair amount of breathability without having the um, membrane in them. They have a reasonable water resistance. I would say that this blocks a little bit more wind than the soft shell. Water, they deal with about the same, but this is so light, it absorbs almost no water. So this could be soaking wet, jump in a lake wet, and it could be dry um, very quickly because there's so little material to absorb moisture that it doesn't absorb a lot. Uh, it's super small and light, and that's an advantage to it. The downsides is they aren't stretchy. It tends to be a real static material. They're kind of crunchy when it's cold. Um, and they don't tend to have real technical features. So they have a little hood adjustment, maybe a little chest pocket. They, they don't have a lot of features. They also lack a little bit of durability. Um, one of their advantages is they do tend to be fairly reasonably cost uh, priced relative to say a, a technical Gore-Tex jacket or something like that. Um, but they have their limitations. So for day trips around town, things like that, the microfiber nylon makes it into my pack quite a bit, um, but generally speaking, I will have something more like a hard shell um, on just about any tri any overnight trip for sure. And uh, but most of the time, I'll try to wear my soft shell, lightweight soft shell, and only when the conditions dictate the the either a lot of rain or a lot of wind will I or both, and will I put on my um, hard shell jacket. So another important thing when you're out is deciding on and, and getting your hands on some base layers. So there's kind of two main choices that people are using for base layers. We have the synthetic base layers, like the polyester, polypropylene um, type base layers, and we've got the wool base layers. Typically uh, with those, it's the merino wool, which is the finer denier. In other words, thinner fibered, longer fibered, wool that's quite a bit more expensive than the rag wool, the, the old school stuff, but um, it has a lot of properties that are nice. So uh, I'm just gonna talk about each of those. Don't get intimidated by all of the different techie gear, clothing stuff. Um, certainly you don't need to have like the, the entire stable of a million different super expensive technical clothing, but it's nice to know why you choose something um, when you do have some choices to, to think about. So to start with, I'm gonna talk about um, the synthetic uh, base layers. So synthetic base layers, again, typically polyester, polypropylene, um, have the advantage of that they're very quick at transporting moisture. Uh, they, the moisture doesn't get absorbed into the fiber. Polyester and polypropylene absorb 0% of its weight in water doesn't mean it can't be wet, but the moisture is just sitting on the surface. It's not in the fibers. And so um, it does tend to move the moisture quite well. That's, a, that's positive to the uh, synthetic top. The synthetic tops also are quite durable um, in that they last uh, a long time uh, for what you get. So those are advantages to a synthetic top. Disadvantages when we start looking at these synthetic base layers are that they wick so fast that you can get evaporative cooling. So if you're wearing just a base layer and you come to a stop and a little breeze picks up, you'll know it, it sucks that it makes you feel cool or cold um, more easily. Another disadvantage of the synthetic base layers is that they are, as a synthetic fiber, they absorb or odors uh, a lot more uh, than uh, natural fibers do. And so, uh, a lot of people, especially people's tent partners, complain about their synthetic base layers when they wear them for multiple days in the backcountry. They can get pretty darn stinky, and so that's that's another downside. And a final downside is that they are plastic. They are, uh, uh, and so um, they are, they don't deal with fire or heat well. So um, you know, easy, more easily melted, and can have problems like that around camp stoves or campfires. So polyester or synthetic base layers. 
My main thing with these is they're quick drying, and that's what I like best about them. So this would be an example of a merino wool, smart wool um, base layer. And so these have some advantages and disadvantages as well. Uh, advantages is that this absorbs, the fiber itself absorbs about 30% of its weight in water, um, which seems like a downside, and it is in a way, but where that moisture goes is into the core of the fiber, and the core of the fiber then um, holds that moisture away from your body, so you don't get as much of that evaporative cooling feel, and that's why people talk about wool being warmer than other materials when it's wet, is because the moisture's in the material instead of on the material, and that can produce a warmer feel to it. So that's an advantage and something to think about when, when you're doing it. Uh, another advantage is that as a natural fiber, it's uh, got a natural odor resistance. The lanolins built in or that are a part of the wool um, uh, are much more odor resistant. Doesn't mean you can't get a little stank going with one, but overall they do pretty darn well. Uh, the, the negatives to these is to start with, they do tend to be quite expensive um, and they aren't as durable. So I figure if I buy these two tops, this one will be cheaper to start with and this one will be more expensive and I'll probably get at least three times the lifespan out of this as I will with this. So that's, that's just a, a, a potential, just a thought process as you're looking at, at layers. And the other interesting thing is, so what I find is in the summer, I almost always end up using wool base layers uh, because I'm not quite as concerned with constant moisture management. I've got the sun available at times, and um, overall, I'm I'm much I'm wearing just the base layer more and not wearing any kind of soft shell or shell, so that. Um, uh, the, when there is a little wind, I don't get that evaporative cooling feel as much. Um, so for me, I wear wool base layers all, all, most of the time in the summer, and I'll wear synthetic base layers most of the time in the winter, because in the winter it's such a critical thing to dry as quickly as possible and really make sure that the moisture is moving effectively outward in my system. And so that's one way to mitigate or manage um, base layers. Um, but to some degree, it also comes down to personal preference. Some people definitely prefer natural materials versus plastics and, and whatnot, and, and that's valid. So in the lecture notes, um, uh, along with this slide, I've got a comfortable winter camping uh, clothing system at negative 20. And I have a list, list of some specifics, but basically a... a synthetic uh, base layer, a light little soft shell jacket, a light little synthetic insulated jacket, um, and a hard shell, and then a big puffy coat would be my four layers on top, or five layers that I would have with me on top. Don't usually have all of them on, but at camp I might. Um, for the bottoms, I'm gonna be wearing some polyester tights, a soft shell bib, um, some, I'll have some light Gore-Tex pants along, in other words, a hard shell, and um, I'll have an, a, a puffy pant, so an over pant that is typically synthetic, might be wool, depending, that provides insulation for that camp type environment. So again, four bottoms, five tops, the 5-4 system, and again, it varies a lot. At, at plus 50, which we might encounter or down to maybe 30 on our later trips, I would, I'll have a little bit different system. But I just wanted to present some ideas about what I might bring in, in that scenario. So I'm sure to some degree you're thinking, oh gosh, he's talking about all this stuff and what do I have? To start with, during this course, you're not expected to have a complete dialed 100% clothing system. This is advice for you to learn. It's a safe learning environment. We're gonna figure it out. And But to start with, um, we'll, we'll sort of start with what you have. And so this is a great way to get started, to think about like getting, developing your clothing system. I've been working on mine for 30 years and I still tweak it and play with it and I'm experimenting with it, partially because I need to teach and know, but partially because I enjoy um, having stuff that is effective. So to start with, what do you own? 
And it doesn't have to have the little Patagonia label on it or whatnot to be effective for what we're going to be doing and what you're going to do as an outdoor leader. What it needs to have is the properties that we're talking about, the fast drying, quick breathing, the windproof, the, all the things that we're looking for. And so a lot of times things like that synthetic t-shirt you got from the 5K you ran or um, the soccer uh, pants, over pants you got from playing on a soccer team or the yoga tights or the whatever, um, those are all gonna be pretty effective outdoor clothes. So we need to read labels. We need to think about what's in our closet, in our drawers that we have access to and start putting together our clothing system. What can you borrow? Unfortunately, this fall, there's no roommates, but overall roommates, um, siblings, parents, um, people like that, friends are all great resources. So like, hey, you've got a cool puffy coat. Can I borrow that this weekend? as you develop your tastes and whatnot. The other thing is Outdoor Adventures has a huge stable of loanable clothing and gear. So this don't feel intimidated. I've got just about everything from base layers to puffy coats, you know, things like maybe socks and underwear, things like that. Um, you probably need to have on your own, but just about anything else. Um, during our field outings, and as you get a feel for this stuff, you can borrow from us, from Outdoor Adventures, from myself. Um, but at some point, as outdoor leaders, part of being a professional and 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 uh, being being minimizing risk and whatnot is having a, an effective clothing system. So as you progress, as your budget grows or your time goes more, you need to think about what what what's my budget, you know. Uh, this semester I'm really scraping by, but I could afford a couple new pairs of socks or a new base layer or whatever and sort of build that stable over time uh, is going to be effective. And then what you're doing, and what time of year, it's really important. I don't wear the same things necessarily cross-country skiing that I would on a big mountain mountaineering trip. I don't wear the same things on a raft trip that I would on a backpacking trip. So having some flexibility in your system to, to be able to deal with the different variables you're dealing with as far as your trips go is important as well. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about a concept called vapor barriers. And this is a concept that's used more typically in the winter time. And what it is, is it's a piece of clothing that prevents moisture from your body from going outward into your insulation. It's most commonly used in boots or footwear. Um, sometimes it's used in handwear and occasionally in extreme situations like Polar Explorers, it's used over your whole body inside your sleeping bag to prevent your moisture from going into your insulation. As, your, as moisture builds up from the inside into your insulation, it can degrade that insulation. Down gets quite degraded over time, synthetic gets somewhat degraded, but nothing is comfortable when it's wet. And so, the idea here is um, an a simple example of a vapor barrier would be wearing like a very thin little liner sock made, you know, wool or synthetic, and then putting a plastic bag over your foot and then putting an insulating sock over and putting it into a winter boot. And that would be an example of a vapor barrier system. So in theory, you would travel a full day and you'd get done at the end of the day, your foot would be a slimy, gross, stinky mess in there and your liner sock but everything outside of that plastic bag, including your insulating sock and your boots would get no moisture from the inside. And that can be a huge advantage for multiple day trips in a winter environment. So it's a concept to be aware of. It's not super relevant for this course. We probably won't really deal much with it, but um, something to, to have in your back pocket if it comes all right, so I've talked a lot about clothing systems and we'll have time in class for question and answer with some of the stuff and maybe some hands-on stuff during our packing demo. But for now, I'm gonna move on to what happens when you mess up? What happens when you have a poor clothing system, you're not prepared, um, your participants aren't prepared or something just kind of goes wrong? And basically what I'm gonna be talking about are cold weather injuries.
So the first cold weather injury I'm going to talk about is hypothermia. So hypothermia is a drop in core body temperature of at least a few degrees. Our bodies are perfect machines that are in homostasis all the time. So basically the blood in your main core of your body, in your brain, in your organs needs to be at 98.6 degrees about um, for the enzymes to work well, for everything to function well in the cell biology. If it's not, things start to go wrong. And the place that we notice it first, or we notice if the core body temperature drops from the outside, is the brain. And so when someone's core body temperature drops and the blood pumping up to their brain is below 98.6 down into, say, 90, 96, 95 degree range, we have a change in mental status. And so basically they lose their alert and oriented mental status and start to become disoriented. And some people refer to this as the umbles. So people lose some sort of physical coordination that could be gross motor skills or fine motor skills. They can become disoriented. They can have slurred speech. Um, and then they, they, um, they, they're just not, their personality changes. And, and sometimes this comes out in the sense of people being very kind of grumpy. Sometimes this comes out in the sense of them not wanting to talk or deal with you or accept any help, which can actually be sort of difficult and confrontational as, a, as an outdoor leader. Um, something to be said about this is it's actually fairly difficult to get yourself hypothermic. It doesn't happen quickly. So even a cold water immersion, you know, as a kid, I remember hearing, oh yeah, you're in 30, you know, ice cold water for three minutes and you're hypothermic. It actually is found not to be true. They kind of had the 110 one rule where you get one minute, you've got that cold response, 10 minutes, you have about 10 minutes of being able to use your extremities. And then you've got somewhere between, we'll say 45 minutes and an hour before you have a, a super significant drop in core body temperature. And so that just gives you a reference point for, okay, so if someone's out hiking and it's cold and they've been out for one hour um, and they haven't been submerged in water, you know that they aren't truly hypothermic. They could be very cold, they could be shivering, they could have um, problems with uh, coldness in their extremities, they could have all sorts of things going on, but they aren't truly hypothermic in a medical sense at that point. When this typically happens is um, a long days um, when people are out. And so it's, it's typically a whole bunch of mistakes someone is making that leads to um, a non-water immersion type hypothermic situation. Some examples of times like that would be someone goes out on a day hike with a group or something, they get lost, they don't eat enough food, it's 40 and raining, which is one of the most horrendous times for uh, trying to, to maintain a good core body temperature when it's that cold and wet. Um, they end up being out overnight without shelter. Those are the type of situations where you get someone who's truly hypothermic and has an altered mental status and, and his body temperature has dropped into that um, a mild hypothermic range. Um, or even the more severe hypothermic. The way we differentiate between mild hypothermia and the more moderate and severe hypothermia is the mental status. If someone, because of the cold, has dropped below awake, in other words, they've gone from alert and oriented to confused, disoriented and whatnot, usually that's a good sign, of, or not a good sign, but that's a sign of mild hypothermia. Once they become verbally responsive, pain responsive, unresponsive because of cold, um, then they've typically uh, moved on to um, a, a significant medical problem of severe or moderate hypothermia where evacuation and immediate medical attention are necessary. To some degree, mild hypothermia is something that we'll talk more about, but it is field treatable. We basically need to get that person some food and some dry clothes and uh, some water to allow their body to warm themselves up and then we need to get them and uh, once that's been metabolized we need to get their metabolism working again 
um, so we can actually treat this in the field. Obviously, as, as outdoor leaders, hopefully our spidey senses are tingling and we're, we're aware of these situations and we can prevent them in the first place through our clothing systems and our eating and, and various things. But if we haven't, um, we can look at treating this in the field. So the other type of cold weather injury I'm going to talk about today is uh, frostbite. So frostbite is uh, one, one interesting thing about frostbite is fr it has to be below freezing to get frostbite. Makes sense, tissues. You can get really cold, you can get miserably cold, and you can actually damage your nerves and stuff a little bit, but you don't freeze and kill the tissue in the same way um, you do unless it's frozen. So that's something. This can happen much more quickly than hypothermia. It's, it's, uh, it has varying levels. So um, from frost nip to superficial frostbite to deep frostbite, and this is a freezing of the tissue. Um, so to start with frost nip is basically an, an external um, part of your skin getting frozen. This is the little white end of your nose or little white ear lobes. Um, this is something where you are monitoring your partners, trying to help them at this point, um, and, and treating it um, by aggressively rewarming uh, frost nip. So this is where you won't have blistering and it won't have gone all that deep, um, and you need to rewarm it and then try to make sure you keep it warm. So this is where we're gonna cover up and whatnot. One interesting fact about Frostbite is almost everyone who gets frostbite uh, is dehydrated. There are a few exceptions to this. Going negative 40, going 60 miles an hour in a snow machine with exposed skin, you're going to get frostbite even if you're the most hydrated you could be. But um, for the most part, well, the frostbite you see um, in the field is from people who are dehydrated because as your blood volume goes down, as you get dehydrated, your blood doesn't go to your extremities as much. We get what's called the shell core effect. And then we have, because of that poor circulation, we have cooling of the extremities, which can lead to uh, potentially to frostbite. So something to be aware of. Um, as we go past frost nip, um, we get into superficial frostbite. This actually goes down and, and freezes skin cells. And the, the, by freezing the skin cells, the ice crystals basically damage them. The more damage that the um, skin has, the darker colored it becomes. And the reason is, is there's more blood present. So it's basically the deeper the frostbite, the more you've gotten down into the, um, uh, basically the interacted with the capillaries more so there's more blood there um, the one thing about super frost superficial frostbite when it gets rewarmed it'll blister you'll have nerve damage it'll definitely be more susceptible to um, to damage in the future and freezing in the future um, and and that's that's def that's a bad thing Typically with superficial frostbite, you aren't losing whole parts of your body. You're not getting the tip of your nose cut off or your fingers or whatever. What's really damaging is deep frostbite. And the reason is, is deep frostbite gets down into the vein, basically the veins and capillaries and prevents your body from being able to fix and heal stuff with its uh, immune system and with its uh, repair system through the capillaries. And so you're getting uh, basically any tissue that gets deep frostbite is dead and it's not going to regrow. The other problem with frostbite, really both superficial and, but certainly with deep frostbite, is there's a huge risk of infection because your capillary system's not working and so your immune system is not able to fight infections off in those areas. And so this is where you're going to be losing parts of your body and, and battling infections. And the other thing is superficial and deep frostbite are, are not very effectively field treated. So they're almost always an evacuation um, uh, uh, when you're in the field and these things happen. So this is get the person out and um, make sure that they uh, are, uh, that they don't refreeze those parts if they do spontaneously thaw when you're out there. So in summary, with 
uh, for hypothermia and for frostbite. Uh, dress adequately, that's kind of what this lecture was about, talking about uh, uh, clothing systems and materials and moisture management as far as that goes. Drink water, stay active. Your body is its heater, so your metabolism is what keep, keeps things going. If you're cold in the field, um, certainly you could put more clothes on, but even more effective sometimes is doing something. So running up and down the trail or the hill or whatever will get you warm quickly. And then really the key, similarly to, to uh, being dehydrated for frostbite, is, not ha is running out of fuel for your body. So the very first treatment for hypothermia is to feed someone 50 grams of the simplest, quickest digesting sugars you can and allowing their bodies to basically rev up their own metabolism through that, um, through that with that glucose and then building that fire, stoking it with some more complex carbohydrates, and then at the end, bringing in the fats and proteins and getting them so that their own internal metabolism fire is gonna get them warm again when they're in that mild hypothermic state. The other thing that's super important with hypothermia is to avoid the mistake train and be prepared for multiple situations. And you can do this with clothing and you can do it with your the other gear that you bring. Frostbite protecting extremities. This is the face masks. This is the uh, things like that. Having good quality gloves and, and footwear. One of the ones as a trip leader that I'm most concerned about is actually foot, people frostbiting their feet. It's an area I can't see, I can't monitor. I couldn't pull off someone's glove easily. I could pull off someone's glove easily and look at their hand and see they're not frostbit. I can see their cheeks and ears and whatnot. But with toes, someone can get can trick themselves into saying, oh, my toes are numb, can't really feel them, to the point where six hours later, they haven't felt their toes in six hours and they take their boots off and they frostbit in their toes. And that can be a really serious situation. So. It's one where I need to communicate more, make sure people are eating and drinking, and um, making sure that, that we've, we have appropriate footwear and whatnot uh, as far as that goes. So to, to summarize and sort of finish up this, this chat about uh, some of the Dress for Success stuff, four keys to being outside and enjoying Alaska weather. Uh, managing moisture with an effective layering system. This is huge. It's kind of the, the crux to the whole uh, clothing system is managing moisture. Um, it, it, it's definitely a big one. So I'm always thinking about what can I do to manage moisture more effectively? What dries quicker? What's more breathable? What, what protects me from the outside from moisture as much as possible? Those are all important things. Being prepared for changes in weather is huge too here. Weather has gone, can go all over the place, even on the same trip, even in the same day. So knowing and being prepared for those different uh, weather conditions that are out there. Having extra things for your extremities is super important. These are gloves, hats, and socks um, to help protect your extremities or footwear and, and making sure that you've got uh, multiples of those and are, are, are there, you can change those up when you need to throughout your day or throughout your trip. And then making sure that things dry quickly and, and effectively wick moisture. One thing that's a truism is you know you're going to be wet. Your feet are going to be wet. Your jacket's going to be wet. There's no magic cure. You can buy the most expensive clothing in the world and you're still going to be wet. And so basically we need to rely on the fact that we can dry our clothing qu quickly. We have fairly effective shelters so that when we need to, we can get out of the moisture. We've got ways to keep our sleeping bags dry so they're not going to be a liability later. And um, uh, we, can, we can utilize uh, those things to help and then to dry our stuff out. So we'll have time during class for me to lay out uh, a clothing system. And we're also gonna have time before the first trip where I'm going to hands-on go over each of your clothing systems with you and maybe help supplement you a little bit here and there if there's anything you're missing or decide between two pieces of clothing or whatnot. Um, we're, we're scheduled to go out here uh, in a few weeks in September and I'm excited about that. And we will um, make sure that that you get to check out uh, your clothing system and, and really uh, see where the advantages are and see what works for you. 
because everyone's a little bit different in terms of their systems. So hopefully this has uh, been informative and I am looking forward to seeing you all on Thursday morning or afternoon.